Wingardium Leviosa. Wingardium Leviosa. We. I. Hi my friend and welcome to the channel, I am Richard Yunders and you are watching Genders Gaming, a channel dedicated for analog gaming. And today I am going to bring you with me to a world of fighting wizards, mighty evil serpents, dragons, a world of weird things but still cool things. There have been books, there have been movies, I've already done one video on this topic before, you can watch that up here. I am, of course, talking about Harry Potter in the Potter universe. We are going to go back into this universe. We're going to run around town. We're going to run around in the school, the station, everywhere to try to fight evil or to join evil. I am talking about Talisman, the Harry Potter version. This is a game from the OP Games, and this is a 2-4 to four player game from 11 years and above. I am going to show you the setup of this game, I'm going to go through the rules and the gameplay. So once you have watched this video, well, you are ready to grab a little wand and run out in town fighting people. No, don't do that. No, just, just don't. You can imagine it, but don't do it in real life. That would probably be bad. Anyhow, let's take a look at this. This is the setup of the game. In the middle of the table for all players to reach, you place the big board. This represents all of the different places that you might visit during your game. This board is divided into three different regions. You have the outer region, the middle region and the inner region. Next to the board we have the fate tokens, the gallons meaning coins, the advantage token, four dice, two different encounter cards, some spells, hello cards, and also some purchase cards. All players also get their character, either by drafting or simply by choosing and getting along. Here you can see what you will start with. In this case, Harry Potter starts with one spell. Down here we can see what type of stats he has. He have magic 4, might 3, life 4, and 5 fate tokens. Meaning that he should have 5 fate tokens. And put this tracker on the same stats that I just showed you. And also taking his one spell. All of the players follow their instructions on their player boards. On your player board you can also see where your character starts on the board. Each player also gets two gallons. The advantage token is a token that gives either the Phoenix Order, meaning the good guys, or the Death Eaters, meaning the bad guys, attack bonus of plus one. This should be facing up depending on which characters there are most of in this game. If there is a tie, the token is placed up for the side opposite of the starting characters. Lastly, we have the Lord himself, Voldemort. He is not a playable character, and his character sheet should be placed next to the board. His little mini here should be placed in the Great Hall. So once we have done the setup, we are ready to start playing the game. And the setup really takes no time at all. It's simply a matter of placing out the cards and dividing out the different characters. And like I told you, you can either choose your character self or you can have one player randomly giving out characters. It really doesn't matter. It's up to you and what kind of playgroup you have. But now we move into the actual gameplay. And this game plays out during two different steps where each player takes their turn clockwise, doing their different actions and then moving on to the next player. But now we move into the gameplay itself. And the same thing here, it's quite easy. You have two different things you can do on your turn. You start with movement and then you go into encounter. Once you have done your turn, the turn moves on to the player on your left and so on until everyone is done. 
but let's take a look at the movement action. Movements in this game is quite simple. You simply pick up a die, you roll it, and then you move that amount of steps. And you can move clockwise or counterclockwise in your region, any way you like to. Remember, there are three different regions. You cannot change regions with a dice move. You need to go to the King's Cross station to do this. But I'm going to show you that in a while. And you may not double back in one single movement either. And once you have chosen a direction, you need to keep that direction. Meaning that you can't move three steps over here and then all of a sudden change and go three steps back again. No, you need to keep the path you're on. And once we come into the inner region, movement change a bit. Because when you roll to move in the inner region, you may only use half of this amount rounded down. Meaning that if you roll 5, you can only move 2 steps. Half of 5 is 2.5, rounded down, you have 2. And if you roll 6, you get to move 3, 2, you get to roll 1, and of course, if you roll 1, you get to move 1. A character that is in the inner region may have second thoughts, and maybe want to turn around again to go back. But they can only do this one step at a time. Now, they ignore everything that stands on these squares, but once they have decided to start moving back, they need to move back all the way to Hogwarts gates again. Meaning that you can't just move one step back and catch your breath. No, you need to keep on going until you have left the building. But how do you even go here? How do you travel between regions? Well, let me show you. To get from the outer region to the middle region, you need to visit King's Cross Station. And if you roll enough to actually move through, you need to test your magic by unlocking the magic barrier at platform 9 and 1 quarter. You need to have a magic value greater than 9 to be able to pass through to the middle section. When moving the other way, you do not need to test magic. But if you instead want to move into the castle, you need to visit Hogwarts gates. Then you need to choose one of your abilities. Either magic or might. After that, you need to roll two die to see if you get equal to or less than that amount. If you get equal to or less, you get to move into the castle. If you get higher than that amount, you stand still and lose one of those abilities. As I said at the beginning of this video, nobody controls Voldemort. So how does he move? Well, every time one of the characters roll a 1, they need to make their movements, but then they need to roll again. This time they roll to move Voldemort. And they can move him, again, counterclockwise or clockwise, any way they would like to. At the beginning of their movement, they also have a chance to move him to a different region. But if this mean, mean sucker ends up at a character location, well, we start to battle. If there are several characters on the spot where Lord Voldemort ends up, the player moving the Lord chooses who he will battle and then they need to decide if they want to face Lord Voldemort's magic or might. Might being his physical strength and magic being well his magic. If the player wins the battle they get to roll one more die to see what kind of benefit they get on Lord Voldemort's card. But if they lose well, they sadly lose one life. No matter if Voldemort loses or wins, he stays on his spot. So that was the first step of a player's turn, the movement. You move your character around by simply rolling a die. If you get one, well then you need to move Little Lord as well. Once you have done that, you move into step number two. This is the encounter phase. And you can encounter, for example, other characters on the same space as you, 
or you can also encounter cards or happenings on the different spots you end up on. When ending up on a space, you need to draw that many encounter cards, as it says, on that space. If there's not already a card on this space. So for example, if there had been one encounter card on Grob's clearing already, you would only draw two cards. But now there is nothing, so we draw three cards. So once we have drawn the cards, we need to resolve them. And we resolve them according to their encounter numbers. Down here you can see a number. And these are the encounter numbers. But some of these characters actually have two encounter numbers. The ones up here are if they are in the same team as you. Meaning that if you are a Death Eater, you should use the number up here. But if you are not a Death Eater, if you are an Order of the Phoenix, you should use the number down here. And it was actually Lucius Malfoy that drew this card. Meaning that he is in alignment with this character. Up here we can see it's number 5, meaning that this card should actually be here. So now we have 3, 5, and 6, giving us the correct alignment of cards. Some of these cards are enemies, and down here you can see what they do. They should be placed on the space itself. Some of these cards are followers, like this one here, and if you have the same alignment as this follower, you may pick it up. But you may only have 3 followers, at a maximum. So if you have more than three, this card would stay on the spot. But then we also have places. And depending on what the text here says, these places will do different things on this space. This one here, for example, says that this will be on this spot for the rest of the game. And every time you land here and have a might that is five or less, you must miss one turn. If it's 6 or greater, you gain one fate. So in this case here, when Lucius visit Grob's clearing, he should put these two cards on that spot. The Dragon Arena, but also Flitch and Miss Norris. And every time a new character ends up here, well, these will trigger. But he also got a follower. This follower is placed beneath your player board, where it says followers. And remember, you can only have three at a maximum. But once you have gained your followers, you can use their abilities stated on the card. And you do not have to pick them up. So if you see that this is a follower that you don't really have following you, well, just let them be. And then you can, of course, battle other players, but also encounters during the encounter phase. A battle will happen if you, for example, like Lucio here, meet an enemy in the encounter phase, or if two players from different alignments is standing on the same space and the player moving in there decides to start a battle. If you decide to start a battle, you can of course not get any benefits or anything from the space itself because you are busy shooting lightning balls on the other person, which makes sense, right? If you encounter an enemy, you will be facing their stats at the bottom of the card. In this case, might 1. Not that bad. At the start of a battle, the character that's being attacked had the possibility to evade. By using, for example, a follower, a spell or some kind of other item that they have that will let them evade the attack and simply move away one step. But if they do not choose to move away and they face the battle and they walk into it, now they have a chance to play cards, to add up to their might or their magic, whatever they're fighting or facing. And they can use these items, these spells, before the battle. Meaning that before you start rolling your dice, you should use your items. So if, for example, good old Dumbledore here would be facing Antonin, they would be fighting magic, as this is his skill. And as you can see, Antonin has a magic of 7. Dumbledore has a magic of 5. 
At the beginning of the battle, Dumbledore could choose to use the invisibility cloak to evade Antonin, as he has magic 7, and this one will let you evade enemies with magic 5 or higher. But Dumbledore is no coward, so he won't do that. Instead, he chooses to use his wand, giving him a magic of plus 1. But he also has Sirius Black as his follower, which also gives him plus 1 to his magic and 1 to his might. Meaning that now Dumbledore has 5 plus 1 plus 1, giving him a total of 7. The same as Antonin. Now the player portraying as Dumbledore need to roll one die. This is added up to their total. Now giving them a total of 5 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1, giving them a total of 8. Now another player gets to roll for Antonin. Remember Dumbledore has 8 and now he has 7. They also roll a 1. Giving Antonin a total of 7 plus 1, meaning he has a total of 8. So we have equal scores, meaning that nothing happens. But remember that we also have the advantage token, and this needs to be calculated into the score depending on which side is facing up. If it's the Phoenix Bird, Dumbledore would have gotten plus 1, but it was the Death Eaters meaning that Antonin get plus one, and he wins the battle. When the enemies win, the characters loses one life. You could use an item or a spell to make sure that this does not happen. But if Dumbledore had won, the character would have taken this card as a trophy. If there would have been more than one enemy with the same encounter number, we would have combined it their magic attack score and simply roll one die meaning that in this example here we would have seven plus three plus one plus one so if you manage to defeat an enemy you get to keep them as trophies and at the end of your turn you can actually exchange these for either might or magic if it's a magic card you can exchange that one and get five magic but if it's a might card, you can exchange that one and get 5 might. So that's the way a battle works when you are encountering enemies. And a battle where characters are fighting other characters are working out kind of the same way. Now, there's only battle between characters of the different alignments. Meaning that an Order of the Phoenix can't fight another Order of the Phoenix no matter how much you want to. Because it's just weird, right? But an Order of the Phoenix can fight a Death Eater and vice versa. And the battle goes out in the same manner. You get to evade if you want to, and then you get to play your cards if you want to battle, to add up to your might or magic. But now you can use the Fate Tokens to re-roll dice once. Once you have used this to re-roll, well, you simply have to accept that result. Then we add up all of the dice and cards and spells to see who is the winner. Now the player who won the battle has a choice. They can either force the loser to lose one life, take one of their gallons, or take one of their objects. If a player ever loses all of their life, they are transferred right away to St. Monger's Hospital. The players that ends up at the hospital would need to discard their spells their fate, and any trophies they have acquired. But on their next turn they get to choose which side they would like to start on, reset their stats, and they get to keep their objects, followers, and gallons. Then you simply roll a die and you keep on fighting. Out on the board you will also be tested, and to complete a test you simply do the same thing as you did with a battle. You use your spells, you roll your dice, and hopefully you are able to pass the test. Except for the normal encounter cards, you also have these die symbols. Down here you will have a text stating out what will happen once you roll the die. To win this game, the characters need to reach the Great Hall. The characters that are portraying as the Phoenix Order needs to defeat him and put an end to him. 
and the characters portraying as the Death Eaters, well, they need to defeat him to prove that they are worthy to be at his side and fight on in the future. Either one that managed to do this first wins the game. If you do not manage to defeat him, you need to go back to the moving staircase and go up again to the Great Hall to try again. So that's how the game works. Each player taking their turns, doing their movements and then resolving any encounter that they have on their space. If it's an enemy, well, you will need to fight or evade. If you meet up with characters from different alignments, the same thing happens. You can choose to evade the one that's attacking you or simply run into battle screaming. I don't think you need to scream, but it's thematic, right? And whoever ends up in the Great Hall defeating Voldemort wins the game. Either by dropping him to the floor and ending him, or joining him in future glory of Death Eater power. Now this game might look like a lot, but it's really not. Just like the other OP games, this one is pretty fast to learn. It's easy to play and you can bring in new players to this game quite fast. But you still have a bunch of strategy in it. You still need to work together as a team. And you still have a lot of things that you need to work and twist to make it work out. And I think that this is where the OP game does a lot of good work with their games. Overall, not just this one. They make it easy, they make it accessible for pretty much any player. But they still keep that need of strategy and also challenge that most players want. So this works for newer players, but it also works for the ones that have played a long time and just want to have a fun time, but still feel the need of having a good challenge. In this game, there are plenty of followers, objects and spells to help you out against evil or against good. And if you have ever read the books or watched the movies, you will definitely recognize a lot of the characters in this game, but also the places. The board itself is well made, easy to understand and has a lot of bright and beautiful colors. Again, with a lot of the artwork that you will recognize from the movies, but also from the books. It's really well made, it's really easy to understand what happens and it's not that hard for you to see where you can or cannot go. And then we of course have the little miniatures. Now, they didn't need to put in miniatures in this game. They could have done with just standees or even meeples, but they put in miniatures in this game. And I need to say that it makes a lot different for the gameplay. At least for me, I love features like this, where you have little minis running around. It just makes you feel like you are actually at the locations and doing these battles. There you have it my friends, that was Talisman Harry Potter from the OP games, a 2-4 to four player game. I, I mean just like all the other OP games, I just like this game. It is simple, it is easy to learn, but it is quite strategic at the same time. All of their games, I mean they're growing on me more and more, all of their games are quite simply made, but they actually bring a lot of weight to the table for new players, old players, Younger players, older players, it doesn't matter, they got something for everyone, and this one is no different. You could bring in a player that have been playing board game for 15 years, or someone that has been playing it for 15 minutes, and I think that they would still enjoy this. Because this is not about you doing a heavy, heavy, heavy game. This is about you sitting down, having a good time with your friends, running around this Harry Potter world, throwing light balls at each other, and at the same time having some co-op, having some battles, having some strategy, but doing a quite light game. I, I quite enjoyed this game, so if you like the Harry Potter universe, if you like Talisman, check this out. There will be links down in the description, and there will be everything you need to know to check out more of this game. Now, if you enjoyed this video, please give me a thumbs up. 
Please throw in a comment there for me. It really makes a lot of difference for me. I put down a lot of work in this and I love to interact with you after the work has been done. And until next time, people, please keep on spreading that board gaming love I know you all have. Peace.